good for the Lord. For you. Be good for the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We pray that you'll continue to be with us through this service. We thank you for allowing us to resolve that technical difficulty so quickly. And right now, we just pray that you would be in the midst of this service, that you would watch over us, speak through us, move within us, and that you would allow us to truly feel your presence and just give us the word that we need for this time to make sense of this world and to be better representatives for you wherever you've placed us. We thank you again for the privilege to come before you, and we just pray that you would have your way and get the glory out of all that we do in today's service. These things we ask in your son Jesus' name, amen. All right, so good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for service. As you can tell, we had some minor technical difficulties that we were just able to work out, but we're thankful to God for that, and we appreciate all of you for joining us today for service. Um, so this is the second Sunday in July. It's an exciting time, well, especially for the two of us, because those of you know know that First Lady and I will be celebrating our third wedding anniversary on Wednesday. So yeah, July 14th, 2018, we got married and thankfully because the world has reopened enough, this year we are going away for our anniversary. So we leave tomorrow. Keep us in prayer about that. But nonetheless, we're still excited to be here today. We're excited to have the time to praise and worship with you. Um, and we just want to thank all of you who've been supporting us with your kind words, your donations, your service behind the scenes, your ideas. Just even letting people know that we exist, it really means a lot. So we thank you for that. Um, we want you to know that your contributions don't go unnoticed, even if most of them are behind the scenes right now. Um, speaking of support, though, this is also the time that we encourage people who know us and people who follow this ministry to uh, um, share. So if you know, if you follow me on Facebook right now, if you're my friend on Facebook, you will see me put up a message that says, well, sharing today's message with the term um, happening right now. So as soon as I find it, which, you know, if you know me, you know there's always an issue with me finding it, and we should expect there to be an issue today in light of the technical difficulties we just had. But once I do find it, I'm going to share it right now, and I see that there have already been four shares and I'm about to be the fifth one. So thank you all who've shared already. Putting down happening right now. And for those of you who decide to watch later on, and even if you're not watching with us live or you're watching with us on YouTube, feel free to share as well, because that is how people find out that we're here. You know, one of the blessings of the pandemic has been 
a lot of churches have become a lot more tech savvy and you know we're included in that but it means that people can participate in our worship from all over the world all they need is internet access so you know if you feel like this has benefited you and you would like to spread it among your network feel free to share if not we're still glad that you're here with us anyway so we appreciate you for that and what we're going to do right now is well, I also want to thank our um, unofficial production sound team who was definitely texting us <laughs> a few minutes ago to make sure that, you know, everything was okay and yeah, everything's fine. We thank God for you all as well because, yes, sometimes we don't know when sound goes out and you let us know. So we appreciate your contributions in ministry as well. But what I'm going to do is go into our song for today, an old song called Thank You, Thank You, Jesus. And... Yeah, it's just something that's been on my heart lately. It's been an interesting past few days, but thankfully God has been there with us and, you know, has made his presence known. And so for that, we're all thankful. So I'm going to imagine you all are singing along with me. It doesn't, the song doesn't have a lot of words and they're very repetitive. So yeah, sing along. You will catch on. Sing along. I'm pretty sure I can hear you in my head singing along. And again, when we have our next in-person event, even though it's going to be the church cookout we've been talking about, we'll probably sing some informal songs there too. So just because it's nice to have corporate worship together. But for now, this is one of those songs that I know I grew up singing this song, I grew up hearing this song all the time. And yeah, it's a bit of a source of comfort. So I hope it is the same for you all. Thank you, thank 
now we're going to have some announcements from our first lady. Hello, everyone. Um, we'll have our Zoom fellowship after church starting at 1230. Um, there, the link will be on our Facebook, and I'll also send it via email. So that will start at 1230, or if we go a little late, it'll start a few minutes after we end. Um, like Pastor said, our church picnic is July 31st. At Core Creek Park, the starting sound turning off. at noon. Oh, um, sound turning off. Okay, well, I'm just going to keep going because we can't do anything now about the song. Um, but thank you for telling us, so we'll look into that next week. Yeah. Um, but I'll just keep going for now because I think my mic is working. Um, so, um, what was I saying? I'm not sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so church gathering after service, picnic July 31st at Core Creek Park starting at noon. And I think that's it for right now. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks for letting us know about the sound issues. We'll, we'll look into it. Right, so just give me a chance to get some tea, and then we're going to jump into the message for today. Uh, somebody else's screen is frozen too. I think no, I think it's, I think it's a Facebook issue. We're going to keep going. And you all hopefully will be able to catch the replay on um, YouTube. Yeah. So now I'm going to jump into the word. And yeah, we'll just send you all a message. Check out the replay. It's recording fine on our end. So we'll put it up as soon as service is over. Yep, and we're told that it's a Facebook issue and not to sound. So again, anybody who's having trouble with us cutting in and out, the replay will be available. We're sorry. This is something that's beyond our control. But now, as we move into the message for today, if you can find in your Bibles um, Genesis chapter 2, that is Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. So Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. And when you have it, feel free to type in amen. I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard Bible. So. That is Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. And I am just going, okay, I did see an amen come through, but I'm going to just keep going because I know we are having some issues. So this is Genesis chapter two, beginning at verse 18. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, and it reads thus. Then the Lord said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helpmate suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. And then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So if you're taking notes today, 
the title of today's message is The Uniqueness of Adam and Eve. That is the uniqueness of Adam and Eve. And I'm going to pray. Let us pray. Dear God, we just thank you for the privilege to praise and worship you once again. We pray that you would be in the midst of this point of service right now. We know that we need you. And so we just pray that you would work on our behalf. Take care of any concerns that we have right now. Just take over, be in control. We pray that you would resolve any technological issues that we're facing right now. Um, that this message can get out to those who need to hear it. And we just thank you. We pray that you would work through us, move in us, and get the glory out of all that we do today. And we just ask that you would speak through me and speak us a word that will truly help us to be better representatives of you. These things we ask in your son, Jesus' name, amen. So as I stated earlier, this Wednesday is our third wedding anniversary. And to celebrate, you know, I felt God leading me to talk about love and marriage today. And if you remember this time last year, I also talked about love and marriage because I was thinking about our anniversary. So, but I'm going to do it from a bit of a different perspective. Because last year, I preached about 1 Corinthians 7 and the way that we in our society today devalue singleness and make people feel as if, you know, if you're not married or not in a relationship or not pursuing a relationship, you're deficient in some way. Well, today we're going to revisit the story of Adam and Eve. And that's because a lot of us in church have been taught to look at Adam and Eve in order to get an understanding of God's original intent for marriage. Yeah, this is a pervasive perspective, and it has been used to justify anything from sexism to homophobia and even transphobia, some aspects of this um, story. And I'm not going to go into the list of slurs and inappropriate sayings that have been derived from the story of Adam and Eve, you know, around any of these topics, though I'm sure you can figure out some on your own. But as a result of the way that the story of Adam and Eve is told and often taught, particularly today's passage that we're focused on about how Eve herself was created, many of us believe that we are incomplete until we find our partner and that God doesn't really condone lives of long, lifelong singleness slash lifelong celibacy. And ironically, we know this is in stark contrast to what we see in the teachings of Paul in the New Testament, as well as in convents, monasteries, and other ascetic institutions that exist in our society, both in the past and today. But this is still a view that leads many people to feel that their singleness in some way is a deficiency in God's eyes. But we know that's not true, and if you were listening to the sermon I gave last year, I've explained a lot about why that's not true. But one of the reasons that people don't understand that God does not devalue singleness is that we tend to discount the uniqueness of Adam and Eve's particular story and that as a result, we tend not to realize how much of it is not generalizable to our individual lives today and to the way our society exists today. So for today's message, my goal is for us to walk away with three key ideas about how Adam's particular story is so unique that it's not as ideal of a model for romantic relationships today as we have been led to believe it is. But first, I'm going to give some very quick historical context, very quick, because there's only one chapter of the Bible that took place before this one. And in that chapter, Genesis 1, it starts with God creating heaven and earth, and in that chapter, we also hear as God created everything, there's one verse dedicated to God creating man, both male and female, he created them. But then when we get back to Genesis 2, we get a little bit more detail. You know, we hear how God created everything and on what day God created everything. And we learn that although Genesis 1 doesn't make this clear, in Genesis 2, we find that Adam is the one that is created first. And that God had given Adam the job of tending to the Garden of Eden and naming just about everything, you know, birds to the air, the fowl, well, it's fowl or the birds, of course, but, um, you know, the plants, the cattle, everything that was around Adam, Adam was able to name it. So that was his job. 
And that is where our passage picks up today because we find, as I say in verse, well, I'll start with my first point. We find that Adam did not know what he needed. So although we gloss over this and we think of it as common sense, I feel the need to point out that verse 18 makes it clear that God felt that Adam needed a helpmate, but Adam had no concept of what a helpmate was. In fact, scripture reports that, again, Adam was busy naming God's creation and tending to the Garden of Eden when God came to the decision that he needed a helpmate. Adam was busy working and fulfilling his purpose and living his life. And you have to understand that for Adam, his whole like reality consisted of some plants, some animals, and God. Like That was it. That's all Adam knew. And why is this important? This is important because for us, In our society today, like from the time we're born, we've been conditioned to believe that we are in some ways incomplete until we find a partner, until we find the person that completes us. And although scripture is ambiguous about this, some people believe that there is a reason that when God was looking at Adam, God decided, oh, well, well, he's missing something, so let me create someone for him. And as such, people try to suggest that no one could possibly be content or whole in their single state. And I know this firsthand because even though you all see me as a happily married man now, I was not just single, but very single for a long time. And yeah, it was a point that people would comment on pretty often. And, you know, so sometimes, you know, I would just get past it. I'd feel good about myself, dress better, take care of myself, you know just feel good about myself. People can see it. And you're like, oh, wow, who are you on a date? Who are you on your way to see? Like, you want to wait on a date or something? That was usually the response. And then I would be reminded that quickly, like, actually, I'm not on a way for a date. I just was feeling good about myself today. You know, and then that quickly, you know, I would remember, oh, yeah, I'm still as single as I was before. And that for some inexplicable reason, People feel like, you know, looking good for yourself just isn't a thing. And that your lack of dating or relationship status is something that they can be okay commenting on. So, yeah, uncomfortable. But that's also a reason that some of us stay in bad relationships much longer than we should. Because at least then we won't have to deal with the shame associated with being single in certain places. I mean, because it is true that a lot of things in our society are built around the idea of a partner. You know, that's just the way it is. Like family units, you think of it as, you know, a couple is the primary part of a family unit. A lot of things are built around the idea of a partnership. And, you know, even as the song by Betty Wright says, you know, after the pain, some people feel that having a piece of a man is better than having no man at all. And for the record, Betty Wright's not the only person who did that. There are a lot of songs that express a similar sentiment. Indeed, some of us would much rather put up with being disrespected, abused, and unappreciated instead of just being single. I mean, we've seen it. People will cry and whine and complain, but will not end the relationship that is causing them so much pain just because they're afraid of being alone and that's because they feel like being alone is a bad thing. And part of it does come from the way we teach about Adam and Eve. Well, I'm here to remind you that Adam, (laughs) the first man on earth, did not feel this kind of pressure. All he knew was God and his job in the garden. It was a much simpler time and we shouldn't get on ourselves too badly for being distracted by a desire of relationships, you know, by comparing ourselves to Adam, like, well, Adam was focused. Adam didn't really care. It's like, well, Adam also didn't know what Eve was or what a relationship was. You know, the context is just all too different. We can't expect ourselves to be singularly focused the way Adam was when there's so much more around us than what Adam had to deal with. You know, we know too much now. He didn't know any of this. Now, on the flip side, though, we also can't get on ourselves if we don't have the desire to be in a relationship. As I said, Adam did not have a concept of what Eve was. He didn't know what Eve was until God presented Eve to him. Um, He had no concept of a romantic relationship or sex either, for that matter. 
like I said, he was focused on his work. That's all he knew. And what I'm bringing this up for is that some of us think that something is wrong with us if we don't have that same kind of drive that maybe people around us do. I know that when I was growing up, I definitely thought that some of my friends, both male and female, were exaggerating about how attractive they saw somebody or how much they really needed to be with somebody. I, I didn't get it. And I'm putting that out there because some in our society act like libido is just a male thing. It's not. Everybody's got it. But the point is that there are some of us out there that just don't desire relationships and sex the way that maybe our counterparts do. And that's all right. You know, I don't want those people to walk away thinking like there's something wrong with them because of the way society talks about it. And there are a lot of people that force themselves in relationships that they don't actually want to be in just so that people don't talk about them. But I want to remind you that remember, Jesus, who is our model, yes, he did talk about the value of marriage, but we also know Jesus didn't get married or have children. And neither did the Apostle Paul. And we certainly can look back in history and see that God definitely condoned their actions. So as I move on from this point, you know, about Adam really not even knowing what Eve was, not knowing what he needed, but God showing it to him, I want to remind you that it is okay to desire relationships even if Adam didn't appear to, because like I said, the circumstances were very different. But at the same time, I also want to let you know that it's okay not to desire relationships because fulfilling your individual purpose may not require you to be in one. Which brings me to my second point. Being with Eve also wasn't really a choice for Adam. See, another thing we tend to gloss over is that Adam's relationship with Eve was very different than our romantic relationships today. For starters, Eve is literally created from him and that is a bond that probably is most similar to that of a parent and child, except that we know that children are typically born out of women or for our trans and non-binary family, people with uteruses. Thus, no other couple could have the same kind of bond that Adam and Eve share. But beyond that, there was literally no one else on earth for him to choose from. Like, there was no concern about picking wrong, because how can you pick wrong if there's only one other person on earth for you to choose from? And see, like, that's something that we had to remember that for a lot of us today, like the relationship process, the hardest part of it actually can, is the part where you find the right person, where you gauge that level of compatibility. And as I mentioned above, some of us settle for people who we are not compatible with just so we won't be alone, often for reasons related to us having poor self-esteem. So poor self-esteem, a low self-worth, or just an out of control libido. But on the flip side, there are some of us who are always looking for something better. And I know that as men, we get a bad rep for this. I mean, a lot of us are superficial and focus more on external appearance than we should be to the point that we may discount or ignore people who could actually be good for us just because there's somebody we think looks better over there. And of course, we all know women who have incredibly long and selective lists that are so restrictive that even Jesus himself wouldn't be good enough. I mean, I can see it right now. Jesus shows up for a date and his date says, I'm sorry, Jesus. I mean, I know you're perfect, but, you know, I don't date men who are homeless. And I heard you say the son of man doesn't have a place to lay his head. Or, Jesus, why do you spend so much time with your 12 friends? I mean, I bet you're out at the club even though you say you're out ministering. And I've heard about you spending time with that Mary Magdalene. I mean, if you want her, you can just have her. I'm not going to stand around being a fool. You, you get the idea of where this is going. And I'm not just making fun of women here because a lot of us are capable of doing the same thing as well. I mean, and although I gave the, re the example of a heterosexual relationship from the perspective of a woman because of the bad Jesus is my boyfriend theology that pervades a lot of our singles ministries and our worship music, you know, we do know that jealousy and insecurity, they know no gender. I mean, just imagine a man dating a female version of Jesus or Jesusa or Jessica, whatever you'd want to call her. I mean, like, think about it like this. They get into an argument. And he's like, why you always got to be right? I mean, knowing she's all knowing, you know, because Jesus is all knowing. And then there's always that man who would like try to mansplain to her about why she shouldn't trust the men she encounters in ministry, even though, as I said, she's all knowing and already knows. You get the picture. And the same is true. Like, no matter how you identify or what you're attracted to, even Jesus wouldn't meet some of our standards in his perfection. And I'm not saying this to say that maybe you should lower your standards and marry someone who's broke and ugly and terrible and all around bad for you. I mean, I didn't do that. 
But what I am saying is that we can't let the fact that we have options allow us to make extremely shallow choices or allow us to go out of our way to like be fault finders, to always find reasons to ignore the choices that we have before us. But my point is this, it was very easy for Adam and Eve to come together because they had no other potential options to choose from. We, on the other hand, have to find constructive ways to choose our partners, well, if we feel we're supposed to have a partner in the first place. And that usually happens through dating or courtship. And before I move on to my next point, I just wanna say this one thing, Sometimes in Christian contexts, especially in conservative Christian contexts, dating is looked at as a bad thing because we associate it with premarital sex. And that's a bit of a fallacy, I'll say, because sex isn't really a prerequisite for dating. It's not a mandatory part of it. And we know that in today's hookup culture, a dating relationship also isn't really necessary for sex to occur. But I'll go on and say that the reality is that the only reason Adam and Eve didn't have to try to date or court is that there was no one else for them to choose from. The rest of us have to get to know each other somehow or trust others to make decisions for us, which is another story. But we can't just expect things to be so clear cut to be like, oh, okay, I see this person across the room. We're gonna get married and have children and live together forever. That happens in some places, but for the majority of us, it doesn't work that way. For the majority of us, we really need to know more and just be like, okay, God brought this person in front of me. Because the other thing is that we understand, like in this case, God literally brought Eve in front of Adam. But sometimes we're quick to say, oh, this person, that has to be a godsend. It's like, no, a lot of times when we think God sent someone to us, he really didn't. It just was our own flesh, our own desires, wanting things to work with that person so much that we ignore every huge red flag that God is showing you. Like, sometimes you're like, yeah, God, I mean, I don't want to put people out of, I've been in some conversations, people like, yeah, this person is like everything that God could ever have wanted for me to have. And he asked him, oh, how so? No answer. But what I'm saying still is this, that sometimes God will make it clear when you're supposed to be with somebody, but you have to learn about that person, you have to gather information, and you have to make sure your motivation is correct with this. So what I'm getting at is that we can't expect things for us to be as clear cut as they were for Adam and Eve when they literally only had each other to choose from. And that brings me to my final point, because not only did Adam not really know what he needed when God created Eve for him, and not only did, Adam not really have much of a choice, you know, he didn't have to have real dating experience like we do because Eve was the only woman that existed. But as a result, having children with Eve also really wasn't a choice for Adam. Because just like we put a lot of importance in our relationships today, our romantic relationships in our society today, we also put a lot of importance into having children by using God's instructions to Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, you know, from Genesis 1. But here's the thing, as the only two people in existence at the time, their procreation was essential to the future of our species. And obviously that is not the case anymore. As of March of 2020, there were an estimated 7.8 billion people on this planet. And that number is even higher today, in spite of the the fact that we are still in the midst of this pandemic with COVID-19 ravaging countries all around the world. But we don't acknowledge that we still make people who choose not to have children come across as selfish and not living up to their God-given purpose. When truth be told, some of us shouldn't have had children either. I mean, it's true. Like, we all know people who resent their kids, and for what? Like, I remember, like, years ago when I was in college, just um, riding the bus to the mall because I didn't have a car that particular year, and I saw this woman that was just cursing out her toddler, like, cursing at that toddler, worse than like you would tell off your worst enemy and you know the baby just sat there and looked confused and sad and wondering like well you know what did i do and it wasn't even clear the baby fully understood this woman while she was cursing at her and i remember just sitting there thinking like wow like what can make a mother what can make a parent want to talk to their child that way in general 
And all these years later, the thought of it still haunts me. The face that the little child was making still haunts me. Because when you see that, it's like these kids didn't ask to be here. But my point is this. Adam needed to have children with Eve because that was their purpose. Their purpose was to be the parents of humanity. But that doesn't mean that all of us need to get married and have children in order to fulfill the purposes that God has given to us. So as I end this message, I just want to um, get this one idea across. And that's that, like I've said, Adam and Eve, their purpose was to be the parents of humanity. But that doesn't mean that each and every one of us has that exact purpose, you know, to get married and have a bunch of children. I mean, instead, it's important that each of us build our own personal relationship with God in the kind of relationship that we know Adam and Eve had because God did talk to them in the garden. And that way, God can reveal what our individual purpose is. And I know it's tempting to think that we're all called to live within that nuclear family structure. That's the way our society has led us to believe. But some of us really aren't. Some of us are called to help our friends and relatives raise their children. And I know many in my family have done that. I was blessed to grow up with an extended family of aunts and uncles and cousins who were always there to help each other as needed. Some of us are called to create a sense of family within our friend groups, you know. Some people are estranged for their families but need something to be a part of. And then some of us are called to live a life of singleness and a life of service, or maybe a life within an ascetic or mon monastic tradition. Meaning, I know I talked about this a bit last year, but yeah, there are just certain things that are a lot easier to do when you are single and when you don't have the attachments that come with a family. And then, of course, there's some of us who, like my grandparents, were just called to get married and have a bunch of kids. And that's fine. The point is, there's no one-size-fits-all approach to this. Just because that was Adam and Eve's individual purpose or collective purpose as a couple does not mean that every one of us that comes behind them is called to do that exact same thing. So I need you to understand that Adam's purpose was just that, Adam's purpose. There may be some overlap between his and yours. There may be some overlap between Eve's and yours. And there may not be. And either way, that's perfectly fine. Is just make sure that you are doing your part to fulfill whatever purpose it is God has given you. And it may look different than the lives of those who are around you. It may be foreign to you. Remember, Adam did not know what Eve even was while he was tending to the garden and naming the animals. But she turned out to be important to his ability to fulfill his purpose. In that same way, we may have no clear understanding of the things or the relationships that God will need to bring our way in order for us to fulfill the purpose he's given us. And it may not make sense to us, but that is where trust comes in. So remember, follow God, and once you're clear that God is with you, be okay with embracing the difference. It doesn't mean that your life has to pan out like Adam and Eve's life. They were very unique, and each and every one of us is unique. So when you start getting concerned and thinking like, oh, I should have been married by now. I should be dating by now. I should have kids by now. Just put those thoughts aside. Put those thoughts aside and seek out God because you might find maybe that's not the direction you're meant to go in. Maybe that's not the direction you're meant to go in yet. You know, but ultimately trust in God and don't do anything because you feel society pressures you to do it. Focus on what God says, and God will make it clear to you. God bless all of you. So now we are going to open the doors of the church. So I know I talked about the importance of having a personal relationship with God in order for us to know what our purpose is. You may be wondering, well, how do I do that now? Because back then, obviously, it was pretty easy for Adam and Eve to talk to God because, yeah, they were the only two people there and God was in the garden talking with them. But how do I do that now? Well, the answer is in this time period, we are able to have personal relationships with God because of the awesome sacrifice that Jesus paid on the cross for us by dying for our sins. And so if you want to have a personal relationship with God right now, well, the 10th chapter of Romans, beginning at verse 9, makes it clear that in order for you to have this relationship with God, 
you have to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. So if you would like to start this relationship with God now, all you have to do is this. Repeat this prayer to me. Say, God, I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that you raised him from the get dead. Again, that is God. I confess that Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. And that's all you have to do. If you've prayed that prayer, congratulations, you're saved. You now have that relationship with God. And God will reveal himself to you, you know, as you pray, as you read scripture, as you fellowship with other believers. God will just reveal himself to you slowly and you'll get an understanding of where your purpose is. So if you pray that prayer, we would like to hear from you. We'd like to pray with you. We'd like to help you figure out your next steps. So we encourage you to either write a comment, fill out a comment card. We just... I um, want to hear from you. You'd hear back from me or from our first lady or from our deacon. And we'd pray with you and help you figure out where your next steps would be along this Christian journey. Or maybe you're somebody who already believes in God, but you feel God calling you to unite with us at Your Will Christian Ministries. And if that's you, we also encourage you to fill out a contact card. We'd love to help you do what um, our tagline says, which is live God's will for your life. So... If that's you, fill out a contact card. You can also write a comment. You'd hear back from me, our first lady, or from our deacon. And we just, yeah, would help you figure out, well, we would figure out how we can assist you on this journey called life. Or maybe you are um, someone who's in need of prayer. You need us to intercede on your behalf. You need us to um, stand in agreement with something for you that you've been asking God for. You know, if that's you, you can also send us a message, send us a contact card with your prayer request on it, and we will pray for you, and we will also reach out to you to see if there's anything else we can do to help you. Or if you want some more information about what we do, just fill out a contact card, and we'll be happy to add you to our mailing list. So with that, we thank you for spending this time with us today for service. We thank you for putting up with the technical difficulties we may have had. And for those of you who were having issues on Facebook today, Feel free to watch the replay or to check it out on YouTube because we're told it was a Facebook problem. And, but the recording on our end is fine and it will be available soon. And you have anything else that we need to add? Okay. Well, with that, I am going to close us out in prayer. But thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate you. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the privilege to come before you once again. We thank you for the word that was preached, and we pray that you would just move within us um, and help us be better representatives wherever you've placed us. We know there's a lot that's still going on in society. There's a lot of misinformation that's being spread. There's a lot of division that exists. But we know that it says in your word that you are not the author of confusion. So we just pray that you would show yourself, move in these situations, and bring the clarity that we need, that you would take care of the division that exists and that you would bring the sense of unity that we need and that you would also help all of us to learn to appreciate the beauty and the differences that you've created among us instead of trying to pressure each other to be carbon copies of one another we just thank you for all that you've done and for all that you will continue to do um we pray for all those who are sick um we pray for the family of the late jackie williams whose funeral is coming up this week. Um, we ask that you just be with them as they're grieving, and we pray for that community, as we know this has been a trying time. We also pray for all those who are sick, those who are still dealing with complications from COVID, whether it's related to their jobs or their health, or just the loss of loved ones. We ask that you would be a source of comfort, um, and that you would help us as a ministry to figure out what we can do to support those in our community who are still in need. Um, we also pray about the racial reckoning that's happening in this country and about the um, political polarization. We just ask that you would help us as a ministry to figure out what our role is and how we can be a bridge and how we can truly represent you wherever you've placed us. Um, and we pray for those who are sick, for those who are dealing with illnesses, and also for their loved ones who are supporting those who are dealing with illnesses, that you would just be a source of strength and 
that you would direct the doctors uh, to do all the things they need to do, and that you'd also bring about a supernatural healing. And yeah, we just thank you for all that you've done for keeping us safe, and we pray that your angels will continue to be encamped around about us, keep us in all of our ways. We pray that you would work to restore familial bonds that have been broken, but also that you would help people's hearts to change because we know that a relationship can't be fixed unless both parties are interested in fixing it. So we pray for all those who desire for their relationships, relationships to be fixed, but are dealing with maybe partners who don't desire that. Just we pray that you would strengthen them, comfort them, and allow them to see that you still love them and you're there and you understand and you see the efforts and that the efforts for reconciliation are not going unnoticed by you, even if they haven't been fruitful yet. We just pray that you will continue to have your way and draw us closer to you and just be a source of comfort and a source of healing for those of us who are hurting right now. And now we pray as we leave this broadcast and in this service and go back to our respective destinations that you would continue to watch over us, you know, and keep us safe until we see each other again, and that people will come to know more about you as they interact with us. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen. So thanks again for joining us for service. Those of you who will be joining us later for our Zoom fellowship, we'll see you soon. And the rest of you, hopefully we will see you next week.